Still in the hunt for veteran options. The Seahawks clearly have a major deficiency in the middle of their offensive line. Are they ready to power up at the guard position in this upcoming draft? Rob Rang and I are going to be breaking it all down on our first NFL Draft Extended Preview here on Locked on Seahawks. You are Locked on Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Any special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you're listening from nearby Moses Lake, Washington, or Reykjavik, Iceland. We greatly appreciate each and every one of you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We are now officially diving headfirst into NFL Draft Content, kick it off our preview, position by position series, and maybe the biggest hole on Seattle's roster right now, the guard position. Luckily, this looks to be a talented and deep draft class at that position group. We're going to look at some first round options, day two, and of course, day three sleepers, probably Rob and I's favorite segment during pre-draft season. All of this brought your way by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets with any $5 bet. That wins. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Now for your lead story here on our Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. As we've been discussing a lot in recent episodes, the Seahawks believe there's still plenty of work to do at the guard position. And of course there is. They only have one player on the entire roster with more than one start at the guard spots after losing Damian Lewis and Evan Brown in free agency, not bringing back Phil Haynes. So, of course, there's been discussion about veterans like Lake and Tomlinson. And yesterday we mentioned Cody Whitehair coming out for a free agent visit. But this is also a really solid draft class of the guard position. And there are two players in particular that we're going to be discussing today in our guard preview, Robin. I think we got to start up with a local product, at least in terms of where he played college ball. Huskies fans are not going to like this, but Jackson Powers Johnson is at least the second best guard prospect in this draft class that's probably going to be able to see Hawks, if not the best. He has the feistiness, the aggressiveness, the athleticism, you name it. He checks all the boxes across the board. Maybe experience being the biggest question mark is only a one-year starter, but uh, it's fitting that he's a player that we're going to start this segment off with because he's a lot of fun to watch on film. No, he really is. Uh, as you said, I mean, he's either the number two guard prospect in this draft class or arguably the top center prospect in this draft class. And it's that type of positional versatility that I think is going to be really intriguing, not only to the Seahawks, but basically to, to every NFL team out there. And as you mentioned, Corbin, I mean, this is a guy that does have limited experience. He only became a full-time starter for the Oregon Ducks this past season, but he was a first-team All-Pac-12 selection by both the media as well as coaches. And that is very rare for a first year starter. But he saw an awful lot of playing time for an Oregon offensive line that a couple of years ago had either every blocker either get drafted into the NFL or at minimum signed uh, free agent deals with NFL clubs. So obviously a very gifted offensive line for the Ducks and yet he still was able to carve out some playing time at both the guard positions as well as center. So again, kind of showing off his positional versatility. 6'3", he's 330 pounds. He's quick off the ball. He is incredibly powerful. He's got as broad a shoulders as you're ever going to see. Um, this is a guy who just looks the part, and his film against Pac-12 opponents spoke for itself. And then he goes to the Senior Bowl, and he was arguably the most dominant interior offensive lineman there as well. There's been some talk out there that, uh, at least among the media, that uh, you know maybe the media analysts out there are overrating him and the NFL teams are not quite as excited about him because you haven't heard any buzz about him. Well, I can tell you, having gone to his positional workout at his pro day and seen 
four different offensive line coaches there putting him through workouts. There is plenty of buzz in the NFL community about JPJ. He's going to be a first round selection. And if he is still on the board at number 16 overall or in a possible trade down scenario for the Seahawks, I think that he is very much would be in play to be the starting left guard per, or possibly even a center position, moving Olo Timmy to the, the left guard position, if that's what the way the Seahawks view. But I do think that he is very much in play for Seattle in the first round. Yeah, I looked at some extra film the past couple days on Powers Johnson because I already had exposure to watching him this season during the year. I watched Oregon play a bunch of times, and my eyes always gravitated to the center position, in particular because I loved the effort that I saw from this guy. A lot of times when you see these 330-pound centers, they're good around the line of scrimmage, but you're not going to see them out in space getting out lead blocking. There was one play in particular and it was against Stanford. And I know Stanford had a rough year in the win-loss column, but it's still Pac-12 competition. And it was on the road. And Bo Nix is one of the most athletic quarterbacks in this draft class. He's a dual threat weapon. He scrambled out to his left and decided nobody was open, took off along the sideline. And he ran for over 30 yards on a play. But you watch the film and not only is... Jackson Powers Johnson in position to play as a blocker there. He actually almost caught up with Bo Nix running next to him along the sideline. It was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. He had a couple other plays in that game where he ragdolled guys on blitzes and stunts. He's as good as anybody at picking those up. So there's a lot to like about him. He does have kind of a buzzed off arm profile, 32 and a quarter inch arms. And I'm wondering how much that's going to be noticeable in the NFL with him compared to college because defensive players were at times able to get their hands in on him before he could get a hit on them. And he has an issue at times with his pad level. So he can get knocked upright and he can bend backwards, be on his heels. Didn't happen a lot. I also think some of that's the scheme, though. Oregon ran so many RPOs, and that makes pass protection a little more of a projection for me with this particular prospect and some of the other guard prospects we're going to be looking at because Oregon did run an offense that was beneficial. That's part of the reason he only gave up one pressure all season. But the other reason he only gave up one is because the dude is just a fantastic player and great athlete can do zone and gap blocking schemes in the run game. I am fully confident his ability to come in as a run blocker right now. Pass protection, I'm confident as well. I do, like I said, think it's going to be a little more of a projection though because Going to a pro-style scheme, even Ryan Grubb's scheme that has some college wrinkles to it, that is going to be a much different scheme. He's going to have more plays where he's going to be asked to block longer than what he did at Oregon. So that is the only area where I maybe have a little bit of concern, but I think in time he's going to be a very good starting center or guard in the NFL. One other player that I want to talk about real quick, Rob, we're talking first-round prospects. We keep mentioning players like – Troy Fotanu from Washington, who may get drafted as a tackle. I'd be surprised if he's there at 16 either way. But Graham Barton is the other name that I think we've got to mention here. In fact, he is my highest graded guard prospect in this draft. It is not Jackson Powers Johnson. And that's after watching five game exposures for both of these guys. Barton just feels like a more well-rounded prospect. And I think he's a better athlete. And that's not a knock on Powers Johnson, but Rob, this guy ran a 484 40-yard dash at Duke's Pro Day at over 300 pounds. I mean, he is a freak athlete, and he played tackle at a high level at Duke. I just think this guy screams all pro caliber guard coming for the Blue Devils. Yeah, he definitely has played very well when he's had his opportunities, both the left tackle position, which he has starred out for the last three years for Duke, and he initially uh, got onto the field as a center. Um, you know, But hey, give the Duke Blue Devils some credit. Uh, they recognized really early on that this was their best blocker and so they moved him to the most important position along the offensive line, that left tackle spot, and he held it down. Even though he's six foot five, 310 pounds, he's got these stubby arms 32 and 5 8 inch arms which is almost certainly going to push him inside either to guard or perhaps to center talk to some clubs out there that view his nfl fit at the center position again because of his frame and because of his mind 
um, just because he does have the savviness that you're looking for at that center position. Because I echo your concerns about Jackson Powers Johnson, at least until I saw him at the Senior Bowl be able to anchor against better competition at defensive tackle than he ever saw in, in the Pac-12. But when going back to, to Graham Barton, to me, one of the things that is most intriguing about him is just his athletic ability. Again, to be able to handle the speed rushers that he saw playing that left tackle position against guys like a Jared Verse from Florida State and all the athletes that uh, Clemson and North Carolina State have, et cetera, Miami uh, have in the ACC. And to be able to handle those speed rushers as well as be able to provide a real punch um, in terms of the running game as well. To me, that just screams a, a high-level starting interior offensive lineman in the NFL. I don't know that he necessarily is worthy of the number 16 overall selection in a lot of people's opinions. I don't give a damn about a lot of people's opinions. I care about John Schneider's opinion, uh, Scott Huff's opinion, specifically, obviously, Seattle's new offensive line coach. And they are going to recognize kind of a plug-and-play offensive lineman here that I think would uh, basically check all of the boxes the Seahawks have always prioritized in terms of high level of competition, positional versatility, and toughness. And, and those, to me, are the things that make Graham Barton very much worthy of first-round consideration. This guy is such a menace in the run game. That is the thing that jumped out to me. And not that Jackson Powers Johnson's not a good run blocker because he's an excellent run blocker. But Graham Barton just jumps off the tape when you're watching him maul guys level defenders into the ground and he does it with clean technique on top of that it's not like he's a dirty player he's just a physical nasty bully and I think that is going to be a perfect fit at the guard spot and like you said some teams view him as a center I can see him doing it he could play anywhere across the offensive line but I think the interior is his best bet to reach his full potential when we come back we're not done talking guards we're going to be talking the big buffet bashers throughout this episode we're going to be looking at some day two studs that could be on seattle's radar if they decide to go another direction with their first round pick don't go away you're listening to the tuesday edition of locked on seahawks this episode is sponsored by better help What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour in your day? For me, I wish I had a bit more time for painting and creating artwork. The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. BetterHelp Online Therapy assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. Therapy has worked wonders for me dealing with all the family-related health issues we've had the past year or so. But don't just take my word for it. Having someone in your corner to guide you when you're struggling to navigate obstacles can be invaluable. Designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule, just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make more for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash locked on. That's 10% off your first month of online therapy at BetterHelp.com slash locked on. You're listening to the Tuesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined as always by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there. Thank you for making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Are you tired of hearing all the screaming on Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. It's streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network's your team every day. Rob, hard to believe, but we are 23 days away from round one of the 2020 NFL. Over three weeks away, and the festivities will be taking place in Detroit. So with that being said, it's time for us to dive headfirst into our position-by-position position NFL draft previews. It's all about the guards today. Maybe the biggest hole on Seattle's roster right now, both from an experience and talent standpoint, maybe even depth added to that. I mean, it's just a position that they need to do a lot yet to really get that 
position shored up for next season. We looked at a few first round options. Let's get to our day two studs. And this might not be the deepest position group in this year's draft class, but I think as our listeners are going to find out, uh, this is one of the deeper ones in this already pretty good offensive line draft class. There's a lot of talent on day two if the Seahawks decide not to go that route with somebody like a Powers Johnson or a Barton in the first round. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I actually projected the Seahawks to uh, you know, basically ignore their offensive line needs, one that uh, John Schneider himself characterized as fairly obvious uh, need. I, I had them going of the defensive lineman in the first round in the projected mock draft yesterday, and coming back in day two and going with Arizona tackle Jordan Morgan, just because, as we just mentioned, with the Duke offensive tackle Graham Barton, Jordan Morgan. Morgan is another one with those sub 33 inch arms that is just going to project a little bit better inside to the mm-hmm. guard position. Like Barton, um, Jordan Morgan is very physical at the point of attack. He has the good size at 6'5, 310 pounds. He plays with great balance um, and consistency in terms of just recognizing twists and stunts and being able to get to the second level. And oh, by the way, while we've talked so much about the, uh, the familiarity, that Mike McDonald has with Michigan in the Big Ten and Scott Huff and Ryan Grubb, of course, have the Pac-12. Jed Fish, of course, was the head coach of Arizona, former Seattle Seahawks, uh, you know, office or excuse me, assistant coach. And now, obviously, the, the head coach at the University of Washington. So Seattle is going to know Jordan Morgan very, very well also. So, again, there's a number of players here I'm excited to uh, kind of touch upon here. But I know there's a couple of interior offensive linemen on day two that you're excited to talk about as well. I would be remiss not to start off with a guy that I actually have a late first round grade on, but I think he will go in early day two, and that is Christian Haynes from UConn. This has not been a football powerhouse by any stretch of the imagination. Former Seahawks head coach Jim Moore Jr. has got his hands full there. It was a rough year in stores, at least from the football standpoint. Basketball, uh, it looks like they have a good chance to repeat going to the final four, but Christian Haynes, do you want to talk about basketball skills translating to the football field? This is a guy that played some basketball in high school, and you can see it with his movement skills. Maybe he didn't test quite as well as I anticipated. He had a fine combine, didn't light it on fire, but had a really solid performance testing-wise. But you turn on the film, this may be the most polished guard, just all-around guard. I don't see him playing any other position. This is his spot. He is a guard First and foremost, he's not going to play center for you. He's not going to play tackle, but he might be the most polished guard prospect in this entire draft class. And you can see it on the film. Didn't give up a lot of pressures, was a two-time All-American at UConn. And this is kind of like Cortez Kennedy with the Seahawks in 92. To get that kind of recognition with how terrible their team has been, that should tell you all you need to know, that this guy is a ball player. He also had a great week at the Senior Bowl. So you're talking about a player that – has contact or has great balance at the point of contact. He can win with physicality. He's got good athleticism, at least in a phone booth. Didn't give up a lot of sacks and pressures. I just think as far as pro readiness, this might be player number one. I don't think the ceiling's quite as high because he's already a pretty polished player, but uh, you're still looking at a guy that early on day two, and if he sneaks into the end of round one even, I think has the value to jump right in the starting lineup and potentially be a Pro Bowl maybe even an all pro caliber player with his polished skill set. Yeah, and he's just so physically powerful at the point of attack. He's one of my favorite guards in this class as well, although where he, where he really took his game to a whole other level, of course, at the right guard position um, for UConn. And so I'm going to switch over to a guy that um, the majority of his playing experience is actually at the left guard position, which, of course, is the focus for the Seahawks at this point, where we are presuming that Anthony Bradford is going to be uh, resuming his role as the starter at right guard, Damian Lewis's absence of course is is it's a huge area of concern for the Seahawks and, and that being Boston College is Christian Ma- Mahogany uh 6'3 315 pounds is a guy that um has been very successful both at left and right guard and you mentioned correctly um the, the Christian Haynes had a stellar week of practice at the senior bowl and that's really where he kind of started to turn some heads because there's not a lot of people going to UConn to watch football nowadays with all due respect as you mentioned to Jim Moore Jr. Um, you know, 
with Christian Mahogany, where he really turned some heads was at the East West Shrine Bowl, um, where, again, I, I think that he was probably, if not the best prospect on the field, regardless of positions at the East West, then certainly among them. And uh, again, it's his size, it's his physicality, it's his pro readiness. I think that he is a rock solid day two selection, one that I'm very high on. And really quick, while on the subject of, of guys from the ACC who are, are just really good football players that aren't necessarily the, the flashiest of athletes, but Zach Frazier, who played center at West Virginia, but still I think that has the, the, the size, the temperament to be able to handle a switch to guard if the Seahawks need him to do so. Uh, again, Zach Frazier is a player I'm really high on. We all know that when it comes to the interior of the line, offense and defense, it's all a leverage battle. And so I love former wrestlers. Zach Frazier was you know, four, uh, won four state championships, all at the heavyweight level, um, in his four seasons wrestling at, uh, you know, West, West Virginia high school. And then he comes in to, to the Mountaineers has been a four year starter at the center position. There a multiple first team, all conference player there goes to the senior bowl and spectacular there as well. To me, mahogany Frazier, as you mentioned with Chris, Hain, uh, with Christian Haynes, I think that is just really showing how deep this, uh, in interior offensive lineman class really is to talk about depth. I mean, we just threw out four names already of guys that I could see all of them going in the second round potentially. And I'm going to give you two more names. One being a second rounder. I think the other one is squarely a third round, maybe even early fourth because he's coming from tackle to guard, but Cooper BB from Kansas state. He is actually my fourth ranked guard in this class. I have him right behind Christian Haynes. He only gave up nine pressures last year. So he is a rock in pass pro he can win in the run game with scheme flexibility. I think this is a guy that can play. You can plug and play him as a multi-year starter, as a zone blocker or a gap blocker. He can do both of them, though. I prefer him in the gap scheme, to be honest with you. That's really where I like to see this guy get after it, get his hands in the dirt, fly out of his stance, and beat up on people a little bit. Not quite the mauler Graham Barton is, but he plays with a physical edge, really sound in pass protection. Another player that I think is clearly just a guard but that's a perfect fit for what the Seahawks are looking for. And multi-time all Big 12 selection has got some All-American honors from various outlets. I mean, this guy is one of the most polished, developed guards in this class. So I've got him with a square second round grade. Could be an instant day one starter. And the last name I'm going to throw out, Dominic Pooney from Kansas. And some of our listeners may not be familiar with the name, but he played tackle after coming over from the JUCO ranks for the Jayhawks. He's got shorter arms, and we've talked about this with a couple of these other prospects. I just don't see him translating to the next level as a tackle because the arm length and his athletic testing was not where you were looking it to be. He ran a 5-3, 5-40-yard dash, for example. I just don't see the athleticism to handle NFL edge rushers. However, I think if you slide him inside, he's got the perfect body to play guard. He's actually played some guard previously at the college level, so there's already going to be some experience there. And this guy was one of the best run blocking tackles that I watched this last year. I think that translates well to the guard position. I think his pass pro numbers will be even better sliding inside where it better fits his skill set. So Pooney's a guy I've got a third round grade on. We'll see where he goes. I've seen anywhere from three to midday three for Pooney, but he's a player that I think from tackle to guard translates to the guy that could play earlier than expected as a day two selection. When we come back, hey, we've got day three sleepers at the guard position coming up. And I tell you what, there are a few players that I am fired up to talk about. I know Rob can say the same. We'll keep talking guards with day three gems, diamonds in the rough. That'll be coming up next year on our Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by our friends at FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney with the Final Four set to kick off in Phoenix. Whether you are betting on North Carolina State and DJ Burns to continue sporting a glass slipper as the Cinderella of the tournament or UConn to pull off a rare repeat, FanDuel makes it more exciting to get in on the action. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. With four teams left in the field, all of your options are on the table at your fingertips. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. 
You're listening to the Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbett Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there. Thank you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Today is all about the guards kicking off our NFL draft position by position preview. We've talked about a lot of the big names that are already out there in draft circles. Graham Barton, Jackson Powers Johnson, two players expected to go in the first round. We looked at a number of quality day two prospects, including UConn's Christian Haynes and Boston College's Christian Mahogany. Let's go to the day three sleepers who are hovering under the radar that maybe our fans and our listeners are not as familiar with. A few of these names, if you follow the combine, we've talked about on this show as well. But there will be some newcomers that we're going to be talking about that could be intriguing day three values in a class that has a lot of depth in this position, Rob. Well, and, and one of the things I think we have to just kind of point out right off the bat is, is that sleeper or diamond in the rough is going to mean lots of things to lots of different people. I mean, you mentioned this list and you mentioned that, that term. And I immediately think of guys like, you know, Mason McCormick from South Dakota state, you know, who, uh, you know, Frank Crum is a tackle from Wyoming that immediately jump out to me as guys that, you know, maybe people aren't familiar with, but I think are absolutely NFL caliber prospects. But again, we are talking about the Seattle Seahawks here and John Schneider, where a sleeper sometimes means still power five kind of schools, because he just has not shown much of a willingness to go with very many small school offensive linemen. So that's where I'm going to kind of focus in on some players that are coming from big time programs, but for whatever reason are getting kind of overlooked a little bit throughout this process. So one of the guys I'm going to kind of start off with in the conversation is, is Satoa Laumea. Um, from Utah. Now, you know, the Utah Utes have done a great job of churning out NFL prospects all, at virtually every single position. But Leomea is a player that is a little bit different than some of the former Utah offensive linemen that we've seen. He's not the brawler or the big, massive mover that we've seen of former Utes. I mean, this guy is very athletic. He has played both tackle positions, both guard positions. It's a four-year starter for Utah, and it's that positional flexibility and untapped potential in terms of his athleticism that I think the Seahawks are going to find really intriguing. And again, we've talked about so many times the, the, the familiarity that Mike McDonald and his staff have at the University of Michigan. So the, the duo uh, uh, Trevor Keegan at the left side, the injured Zach Zinter. And Zach Zinter would be a, probably a day two, maybe even a day, a first round selection um, based on what he had shown on tape previously. They are both three year starters at the guard positions for a team that won back on uh, not only the national championship, of course, but prior back to back Joe Moore award winning offensive line. And a big part of that was because of the stellar play of their pair of six foot five, 320 pounds just earth movers at the guard position. So again, those three players, Utah, Michigan, Michigan, I mean, way to go with the low hanging fruit there, Rang. I get it, but that's what the kind of guys that John Schneider has prioritized in the past. Well, since you took all the low hanging fruit, I'm going to climb up the tree and I'm really going to search for that uh, desirable sleeper, that diamond in the gem, that, that berry that you haven't tasted before. And so I want to start off with somebody that, I thought was going to be a top tier NFL prospect when he landed at the University of Georgia four years ago. And that's Clay Webb. Now, unfortunately for him, he didn't get an opportunity to play very much in his first two years of the Bulldogs, because unless you've been sleeping under a rock, you know, the kind of pro talent that's come off of Georgia's offensive line the last few years. And there just wasn't an opportunity for him to play. So he transferred, he left Georgia, former five-star recruit, and Webb lands with the Gamecocks of Jacksonville State who were transitioning to the FBS level. So he has still been playing against FBS competition, not FCS competition. So it has not been a level down necessarily. Obviously, he's not playing SEC players anymore, but he's only 290 pounds. He's 6'3", 290, so kind of a lean guard. And yet you turn on the tape and you just feel like this guy can't weigh 290. There's no way. He plays like he's 325. And he really gets after it in the run game. He is a body mover, has a mean-spirited playing style. Oh, by the way, he's had a top five, top five rushing attack in Division I FBS this past year. Who was the big reason for that? None other than Clay Webb. So I actually have a third-round grade on this kid. And I don't know why. I mean, I understand playing at Jacksonville State 
might be hovering under the radar, but not seeing anything about him as a draft prospect. I can tell you there are a few NFL teams out there that know who Clay Webb is, though. So this is a player that I'm really intrigued by. And another smaller school player that I want to mention that had a really fine season, A.J. Gilly from Louisiana Lafayette. Different body type. He's listed at 328. Looks like he's around 340. He is a massive human being, and yet he's nimble. He's got light feet, had really good pass protection numbers this past year for the Ragin' Cajuns. He can move people in the run game. He's better in zone blocking than you anticipate. I'm going to throw a comparison out here, and again, I'm not big on comparisons, but look at the Seahawks' right guard right now, Anthony Bradford, who is a better athlete than you'd expect at 330. I see a lot of Anthony Bradford in A.J. Gilly at Louisiana Lafayette. So if you're looking to have two players that kind of mirror each other in terms of skill set, and that's sometimes a good thing because it really helps you figure out your scheme in terms of the run game. I think both those guys, though, are better athletes than advertised and can handle zone blocking. So Gilly, McCormick, as you mentioned, had a great combine from South Dakota State. I've got him as an early day three player that can play some center as well. So all three of those guys being smaller schools, one FCS guy, two FBS players in non-Power 5 conferences, all under the radar. But I think all of these guys have the upside to be starters at the next level. Maybe not right away, but they can certainly start in the NFL if properly developed. Yeah, and and once you mentioned just the size of Gilly, uh, it just kind of made me laugh, especially when you use the light comparison, say light, light comparison to Anthony Bradford. That reminded me of Jeremy Flax, a, a player that played at the right tackle position for Kentucky. Corbin, he is listed, I believe, at 330, but he moves more like a 350 pounder. Um, and that can definitely be a detriment. But at the inside position, at guard, I really think that it can be a huge benefit as well. He is surprisingly light on his feet for that size um, and is very powerful and obviously battle tested to go up against SEC competition. So again, uh, I do think that there are some tackle converts to guard that I think are really going to intrigue the Seahawks here. Look, we it makes the most sense. It's most logical to find a guy who has played every snap of his college career at the left guard position, but some of the absolute best in the league actually played other positions at the college level. And I think that's what the Seahawks are looking for is somebody whose best play is coming rather than back at the college level. And that's why I've outlined some of the guys that I've outlined here in this segment, because I'm looking at a guy like a Clay Webb who has that five-star pedigree. And when you turn on the film, you can see it. And I watched his game against South Carolina this last season. And I know South Carolina isn't one of the elite programs in the SEC, but Rob, you and I both know that those Gamecocks have had some really good defensive linemen come out of the college ranks in the NFL draft for the last decade plus. I mean, that's one of the strengths of South Carolina's program. And he was going against some studs there in that game and absolutely was dominant for Jacksonville State. So even when he played that better competition, he played well in his limited action at Georgia. So those are the kind of guys you're looking for in this process. And John Schneider has been very good about that. And I think the difference here, you mentioned the Power Five programs. I think somebody like a Clay Webb or even A.J. Gilly, those are still clear Division I FBS level players. And I think that the Seahawks will look at, especially a player like Webb, who's got the Georgia pedigree, has played in the SEC, has played against SEC competition. Those are the kind of guys that John Schneider would be willing to say, I know you're not from a Power Five program, but you have what it takes to play at the next level. So I'm really curious to see what the Seahawks do because I could see them draft two guards in this draft, one early and then one of these sleepers that we mentioned to try to really fill out that interior offensive line for both the present and the future. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbett Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Subscribe and follow Locked on Seahawks on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. When we come back tomorrow for our Wednesday show, the Seahawks add a dynamic athlete to their kick return game. We'll break down that latest free agent signing and we'll continue our position by position NFL draft preview. Go into the safety spots. We're going from O-line to the secondary. We hope you'll be joining in and thanks for tuning in to our Tuesday show. Go Hawks.